What do you think the future of media through a Web3 lens looks like? I mean, personally, we think it's everything. Um, when you think about it, like in Web3, one of the biggest concepts that people talk about a lot, and I'm sure you've had conversations about with other people who you've spoken with, um, when you have this public data and you have this kind of more open approach to IP, it's all about content. Like everything is about media in Web3. Um, and so, I mean, we take it very seriously. I mean, for us, our kind of mission statement is scaling Web3. And how do we think that's going to happen? We, we think it's going to be through these kind of cultural elements, right? Like bridging crypto and, and music or art um, and sports and gaming and all of these places where people already find community and find identity and then bringing them into this technology. It's, um, I think about it even from like an independent journalism standpoint, how could you apply some of these principles of this evolving internet to say something like independent journalism? Yeah, it's a good idea. I mean, I'm not a journalist, but, mm -hmm. but certainly I write online. And yeah. even for me, it's been interesting figuring out what my community looks like, bringing it from Web 2 to Web 3. And so I've written on a bunch of different platforms, right? Like Medium, and I have a Substack and things like this, and I have this audience. And actually, the day where I recognized this the most was it was a couple months ago when all of the Facebook apps went down for a day. Mm -hmm. Do you remember like Facebook yeah. and Instagram and WhatsApp? They all went down for like eight hours. And I guess like my livelihood doesn't necessarily depend on having these channels, but for a lot of people it does, right? Like creators right. on Instagram or people who have Facebook groups and run businesses through that, or people really were like the only, you know, way that they can interact with their audience is through these channels. And I think they realized for the first time, like, holy shit, if these platforms go down tomorrow, I actually have nothing. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I moved over from these kind of web to platforms writing onto Mirror, for example, where mm -hmm. everything is stored on the blockchain, you can see it. Um, and I also have kind of real ownership of that audience, which you don't really have in Web2. I wrote this piece called DAM, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Media Networks. Uh, I wrote it with my good friend Kieran, who's building a cool kind of Web3 social protocol. But basically the piece we wrote was sort of a thought experiment. What would a media network like Instagram, for example, look like if it were collectively owned and operated by its users? And mm -hmm. so I think this carries over to CNN or any other type of kind of media network or platform. But with Instagram, for example, when you're, when you're not a stakeholder or you don't have ownership in the network, you're really only incentivized to benefit yourself, right? And that's why you see people on Instagram doing like for like, follow for follow, spamming mm -hmm. the feed using a ton of hashtags, oftentimes posting hateful speech, right? And it results in a net worse experience for the user. The other interesting thing is because users aren't shareholders in the platform, they don't really have a say in what makes the platform better over time. A good example of that is a couple of years ago when Instagram replaced the post a picture button with the shopping tab. Right. And I there was a lot found, of controversy there. Right. I remember the founders of Instagram were so upset about the actual original founders who were no longer there were very upset about a lot of these product decisions, but they totally. didn't have control over it. Totally. And I mean, I don't blame them, right? If you're a business, yeah. like this is a step towards making this a better business and better returns for you. But I think if the community were shareholders in this platform, that decision wouldn't have been made, right? That's not why we use Instagram. So our kind of thought experiment was like if you have collective ownership of these networks instead of doing all these things that i said you'd actually be incentivized to make the experience better for everyone because then the token price of the network would go up when you say collective ownership what does that actually mean so let's say we're applying it to a media company and you talk yeah. about have, wanting people to have ownership in the media company which is very different than say let's say, look at traditional CNN, right? We are, we get ads and it's, uh, you know, we know what experience that is, but we don't own any part of CNN, right? Um, with Instagram, we don't own our feeds. If Instagram were to disappear tomorrow, we would say goodbye to all our data with it. So yep. this radical idea that users could have ownership sounds great, but what does it mean? I would say like good examples to talk about it that we can dive into are DAOs and just other kind of tokenized networks. Mm -hmm. I mean, DAOs can, can spread across anything. Basically, it's a group of people who come together around a certain mission or a goal, and they have collective ownership in that network through a token, for example. And so I'll give some examples. Gitcoin funds the open web. Party DAO builds software. FWB or Friends with Benefits is almost kind of like a social club. Uh, Forefront is probably the best example for something like a CNN, which uh, is sort of like a media and publication DAO. And with Forefront, for example, you can earn Forefront's native token by 
posting articles to their publication, by editing them, by distributing them, creating other content, creating mm-hmm. graphics and imagery, and now everybody's a part of it. Right. Um, and the interesting thing about DAOs is like the speed to join is so much faster. And so you're able to spin up these really powerful networks and communities in a way that you can't really do without this technology, right? A bunch of people can come together, or I, for example, could join Forefront and then within one day, you know, part, post an article to be reviewed and then earn natively for doing that work. It, you've written about something called the social token paradox. Mm-hmm. Can you it, describe what that is? Generally, what I wrote about in the piece is you have this paradox where when you launch a social token for your community, like for FWB, or if I were to launch a token for, you know, like writers in Web3 or something like that. And really quick, just define to folks who don't even know what a social token is. Can you just define that really quick, too? A social token is essentially um, kind of like a native token or a native currency Mm -hmm. within crypto that allows you to kind of govern a network. And so... Um, you can be a shareholder of a community by buying tokens to be a part of it. And so there's this paradox of building out a more decentralized open environment, but also these companies get much more power by having these exclusive networks. So yep. help me walk through that and what we can do to actually um, you know, make it so it's not as much of a paradox. Yeah. So right now, kind of as I said, The value of a community in Web3 is oftentimes directly proportional to its token price. And so if you join a community and the price goes up, you know, from the outside, you think this is a community that now has gotten more valuable. I really want to be a part of it. The problem is, as members of the community or people who kind of organize this community, you run into this problem of if you want your token price to go up so your community, you know, increases in value, the only way you can do that is by decreasing the token supply or Mm -hmm. increasing the price of the token. And either way, it results in a much more exclusive community and it makes it more difficult for people of different backgrounds and perspectives to be a part of it. It becomes a lot about capital, right? Like what Mm -hmm. you have. Um, I think it's a general problem that we see in Web3 right now is much of your kind of digital identity in Web3 is based around what you have. It's what NFTs do you have in your wallet? How many tokens do you have? I think the solution is, which we're working towards, is to make Web3, a lot less about what you have and a lot more about what you do, right? What have you done on chain? What communities are you a part of? You know, what do kind of the stories in your wallet tell about you and the things that you have done in this ecosystem? And I think that it'll lead us to a much more kind of like meritocratic and and, and most importantly, really accessible kind of ecosystem. Uh, Back in December, you talked about the state of the internet and where we're at in the evolution of the internet. And you said something to me that resonated, you said that the internet has become very lonely. Why do you say that? I think the internet is quite lonely and I think we haven't quite solved for this yet, is for decades we've already solved this idea of bringing URL to IRL. So IRL to URL has been solved for decades, right? You know, adding your college friends on Facebook or taking a picture and putting it on Instagram. What hasn't been solved, I think, is URL to IRL, taking digital native experiences or digital native relationships Mm -hmm. and bringing them into the real world and kind of bridging that gap. And so interestingly, I think the only place where it has been actually solved is online dating, (laughs) where you meet someone online that you never would have met. Maybe you have no mutual friends with them. Maybe they live in a different state or a different country, and then you can meet them. And now it's no longer taboo, right? People get married all the time meeting from online forums or online dating and things like that. But largely in other areas, it hasn't quite been solved for. And so I think the reason the internet is so lonely is we haven't figured out a way to share our digital native experiences with each other, right? We don't just take pictures anymore and put them on Instagram, but we take screenshots. We don't just buy art, but we buy you know digital art and NFTs. We don't just follow you know celebrities, but we follow digital native influencers. We've got all of these digital native experiences that have just started to emerge over the last decade, and we don't quite have the platforms to share them with each other yet. What do they look like when you, if you could um, look into a crystal ball and say, okay, in the same way that you talk about dating and how it's like one of the actual places that solved this? Yeah. What are other venues that this could be solved for? Like, where could you see this going? So for a while. Um, for many years, wallets were really built around one thing, and that's transactions. Buying, selling, holding tokens, right? If you think of MetaMask, which is one of the most popular wallets out there, it was created you know, over three years ago. Um, and since then, so many new digital native behaviors, particularly within Web3, have emerged. We don't just buy and sell and hold tokens anymore, but we buy NFTs and 
most importantly, we want to showcase them to our friends, right? We contribute to DAOs. We have these like internet native relationships and you can see them on chain, right? Like which wallets do you interact with the most? There are all of these stories that can be told from this data and existing wallets aren't capturing that value. And so we're really excited about thinking about, you know, what a Web3 wallet might look like compared to a crypto wallet. And how do you kind of showcase these experiences and tell these stories to hopefully, you know, make the internet a little bit less lonely? Well, it's also the internet, if we're not careful, it's going to get a lot more lonely because we're entering a time where we're all um, going to be living in these more immersive environments, right? I'm not sitting here thinking we're going to be in Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson, yeah. right? But we, our children are going to be growing up in video games, right? And making friends in these spaces. And that's really interesting. But if we're not careful and if we don't make that connection, we run the risk of, taking us even further down the rabbit hole that we went with Web2, where our relationships sometimes were solely based on some of these more um, superficial environments, say like Instagram and whatnot, and where we don't actually get that human connection. And, and so how do we make sure we don't lose human connection as we enter a new era of the web? Yeah, absolutely. It's a tough question. Um, I think it's about having platforms and having ways to kind of bridge those gaps. I mean, for me, I grew up on the internet, right? I actually grew up selectively mute. So for a number of years, I didn't really say much. Um, and I also grew up in the era of like having a computer room in your house. And so basically for a lot of my childhood, I was just hanging out on the computer, right. hanging out on Minecraft, playing RuneScape. I had a Tumblr blog, all of these things. And a lot of my closest friends growing up actually came from these online networks. And so I don't think it's a net bad thing that we spend more time online. Yeah, I, it's interesting you talk about um you grew up selectively mute. This was um, from from the age, if I read correctly, of five to 10 years old. Yeah. Does it feel like now the, the world's kind of catching up to what you saw back then? It feels very full circle. I mean, it's interesting. Much of my career started during COVID. And I think largely I was able to kind of thrive in that environment because I was so comfortable living kind of a digital life and having a sense of a digital identity because it had been part of my life for so long. And now, particularly during COVID, the rest of the world has kind of caught up to it of, you know, where do we find community? How do we create a sense of identity online? And how do we portray ourselves? I read a statistic recently, I think it was like 60% of Gen Z think that their identity online is more important and they care about it more than their identity offline. So, you know, certainly I think that's only gonna increase. And so ways to kind of create that sense of a holistic identity, I think is really important. You think of like fragmentation between Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and every platform and you're kind of a different person on all of them, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm honest on all of them, but me on LinkedIn is not necessarily me on Twitter and it's definitely not me on Instagram on my close friend's story, right? And so how do we kind of create a sense of an, of an identity that you can kind of take with you between these platforms? That sense of interoperability is huge in Web3. And then most importantly, a sense of identity that you actually own, right? Platform agnostic thing I worry about is how do we make sure if we're going to go back to that uh, more utopian decentralized version of the web of how do we actually live up to that as we yeah. build out a new era? How yeah. do we actually let different types of folks build it as opposed to a lot of the same types of folks who even built the last era? Yeah, sure. I mean, and for what it's worth, that's probably my kind of biggest worry in the space too. Like it's an incredible privilege to be a capital allocator, basically like pushing forward the narratives that you care about. And so my biggest worry is I'm going to help to build an ecosystem that is just as exclusive as the one before that I had problems in. And so I, I certainly think about it a lot. Um, but back to your question, I mean, from sort of just like a values perspective, when you have open protocols that anybody can build on, it creates a lot more competition, right? Because anybody can build consumer experiences on top of them. And what that does is it creates a lot of more, a lot more innovation. And the winners will end up being the ones that just serve consumers best, right? So, you know, morals aside, internet history aside, everything. As an investor, I believe the most powerful consumer applications of the next decade will be built on these permissionless protocols because it's going to be more competitive, it's going to be more innovative, and it's just going to be the place where people build products that serve consumers best. Last question. How do you define Web3? I say that Web3 is what the internet was supposed to be all along. <laughs>